I analyzed a lot of games of Gary Kasparov to see how he handles a pin like that. In fact, Gary even awarded me with a prize for that. Just kidding, it wasn't for that. Anyway, the point is, this pin is something that you face in probably every other game that you play, and that's how your opponents often try to initiate an attack against you. Some time ago, I recorded a video about a similar subject showing some games of Garry Kasparov where he used the most aggressive approach, kind of pushing with h3 and g4 against this bishop, and although it works, and you guys send me a lot of positive feedback about that video, I also understand that it's a riskier approach, and you can also go down if you don't handle it properly. So for today's video, I want to share with you another plan and that Garry Kasparov uses equally often against bishop g4 to punish their opponents badly. Here's a game of Garry Kasparov playing white against being hero. Black responds with pawn e5, knight of 3 knight c6, bishop c4, so far all the standard stuff. Here black will typically either mimic your move with bishop to c5 or knight to f6, which doesn't matter because you're gonna follow along the same plan. Let's say if they start off with knight f6 attacking this pawn, you can just defend it by going bishop pawn to d3, and then they'll usually develop their bishop anyway. Now here's the first distinctive feature of Kasparov's plan. Instead of going knight c3, as amateur players usually play, he boosts the pawn there. Now, that serves a couple of purposes. First, it takes away this d4 square, therefore black can no longer jump there with their knight any longer for the rest of the game. Secondly, it keeps black under the pressure of you pushing forward with d4 at some point and initiate that attack. You don't have to do it right away, but it's always something that black has to keep an eye on. And finally, we have different plans for this knight on b1, which we'll see in a moment. Black goes d6 in this position, I've noticed that Kasparov always drops his bishop to b3, which looks like a mysterious move at first, like why would you move the bishop twice when you have the rest of your army undeveloped, but there is a good reason to do that. And it's quite a sophisticated plan, I got it, so you need to a little bit m make some little effort to understand why he plays all these moves, but after that it's simple, because you can replicate this in all the games that you play. Now, so the reason for this move bishop to b3 is that, first of all, this bishop is quite a good piece. It's gonna target black long term after they castle, for instance, there, and it's nice bishop, we wanna save it. Therefore, if black ever tries to attack it with knight a5 or something like this, from b3 your bishop can always hide back to c2 and your opponent can never capture it. So that's the first reason. And the second reason is that we evolved, uh, avoid any efficient pole traps. So, for example, if instead of bishop b3, white were to castle, Black can possibly try out this fish and pole trap with bishop g4, and as you try to play h3, instead of you know trading or moving back, black can try pawn to h5. Now, objectively speaking, this is not dangerous for white, and white can take the bait and then defend his position successfully, but for amateur players, you know, it's quite a challenging position because you have to play precise moves, and black has some attacking ideas here, or g3, you know, using this pin, so it could get unpleasant for white, and it's easier to just avoid this altogether. All in all, bishop b3 is a useful move because it saves your bishop from being traded off, but also it's an awaiting move. Because in this case, if they go bishop g4, their idea to pin your knight down to the queen, you just play h3 safely, pushing the bishop back or forcing the exchange. In this case, h5, this fish and pole trap, makes no sense, you can just take it, and if black recaptures, then the fish and pole trap gone very wrong, <laughs> obviously, for black. It's almost like an internet meme, when I learned a new opening trap and decided to try it out. Right, so here you don't have to worry about this. Therefore, as soon as your opponent puts his bishop to g4, he can chase it away with h3, forcing it to make some decision on do you want to trade, do you want to go back, and normally they're, they're going to go back. If they trade on f3, then there is no pin, no problem for you, and we're going to talk about that a little later. I'll show you how to attack there. In most cases, they will try to maintain the pin, and so they'll uh, drop the bishop back to h5, trying to maintain the pin. Then you can simply castle. Your opponent castles happily just as well. He thinks that he's been smart pinning your knight and that gives him some chances in the middle game. In fact, he's living in the delusion because you're gonna use this very same bishop to execute your own attack. And you do that by maneuvering your knight from b1, you actually wanna transfer it all the way to g3, which will hit the bishop as well as support your attack down the road. But for now, your opponent knows nothing about this, so he still plays some moves, doesn't really matter. Let's say in this game, play queen to d7, you go rook e1 in order to vacate this square for the knight, and also e1 is a good position for the rook anyway. In the future, if you ever want to push in the center, your rook will also influence these squares, so it's useful. Black went rook to e8, and here we go with knight to f1, and the knight is ready to jump here to g3 and to attack this bishop on h5. 
Now, I understand that this whole plan seems to be a little bit old. You may be wondering, like, why White does not develop their queenside pieces, but is horsing around with a knight. Uh, well, like, I can't tell you for sure, but somehow this plan works really well for White. The center is closed, there's not much black can do. Sometimes they start pushing pawns on the queen side, like a6 and b5, which again doesn't change anything, you just keep pushing with your own plan. In this game, black played a little bit of a mysterious move, knight to d8, which was kind of weird. Um, anyway, after knight d8, you can just do the same thing, knight g3 attacking this bishop, and from g3 what's nice for you is that besides that your knight is also eyeing the square f5, which is a really juicy square. If you ever land your knight there, it's gonna put a lot of pressure onto black's king side and overall. But right now black has to do something about this bishop on h5. And if they go back to g6, now this bishop is completely passive, it can't even go anywhere, doesn't do anything, so your knight on g3 did its good job. And in the current position, like, I'd say that because black played these weird moves, like knight to d8, it was the best for white to just go bishop g5 and put the same pressure onto his knight. Kind of do onto others what they did onto you. Alright, but in this case for white it's a lot more effective, because there is no convenient way for black to defend this knight, you can just take it and disrupt his pawn structure, and then the king will be weak and you'll continue your attack as usual. So instead of this, I'd recommend that we check a more natural move of black, the one that you're gonna face more frequently. Usually black is gonna play pawn h6 themselves, trying to stop you from playing bishop g5 and executing this threat. And if they go h6, in some way it actually helps you. You proceed with the same plan, knight g3 attack this bishop. As they go back, you then keep pressing with knight to h4, and strangely enough it threatens to win a bishop for nothing. Because notice that this pawn is pinned down to the king, and therefore if you take this bishop your opponent won't be able to recapture, he'll just grab the bishop for nothing. If your opponent is smart enough to see this, he'll drop the bishop back to h7 so that you can not just capture it for nothing. And then you have two usual ways to proceed here. You either land your knight to f5, and that's a really great position for the knight. It's also supported with his brother from g3, so if it's traded, you still maintain your knight there. And then you continue attacking, it's a very nice position. The other typical move for white to play in all these variations is to bring the queen to f3. Now this square is available for our queen, and from here we also keep adding more and more pressure against black's king. So we kind of use this bishop that black tried to use to put pressure against us to gain a lot of extra tempos to develop our own attack on the king side. And now black is actually in big trouble, because you're gonna play knight h5 on the next move and just notice that, let's say I'll play some move for black, just notice that you have like so many pieces, you know, looking towards black's position, towards black's king side, and it's really difficult for black to survive here. Like all kinds of, you know, sacrifices here on h6 are coming or g7 and black's in big trouble. Quite often instead of a6 they try to play something like knight to e7, trying to cover the square f5 so that they can trade off your knight, but then they overlook another common tactic, that's bishop takes h6. In this case, it's not even a sacrifice, because not only you disrupt your pawn structure, but also on the next move you can get a piece back, and that's just a winning position for sure. Your bishop from b3 is doing a good job. Remember, we talked about that previously. It's a really strong piece, you want to keep it. You see now how useful it is for white to have this bishop from b3. Also, this pawn h6 is hanging. You're threatening to jump with one of your knights forward with, let's say, knight to h5, followed by queen g7 or knight f5, let's say if they go here. I mean, you can win with any natural move, for example, knight f5 followed by queen g7 checkmate, supported by the knight. So you see how easy it is for you to develop your attack, and what's crazy is that you make pretty much the same moves against anything that your opponent tries. Alright, let's go over these variations once again real quick so that you can remember it really well and also I'll give you a couple what-ifs so that you know how to react if your opponent goes sidewise. So for example, after bishop c4, if they go bishop c5, you can play pawn to c3 pretending like you want to play the main line of the Italian game, but as they try to enter it, you say nope, and you just change your mind and play pawn to d3, because that's really the pawn structure that we're aiming at. Now let's say they castle, you castle as well. By the way, you do not want to play bishop g5 too early in the game, it actually can backfire as we see, <laughs> so you just want to castle. Now as soon as your opponent goes pawn to d6, we notice that Kasparov drops the bishop back to b3. Now, what's the point? Well, we want to avoid any kind of knight a5 things that would take away our bishop. And previously it was not an issue really, because the knight from c6 had to defend this pawn on e5 because we are attacking it. 
right? So the knight couldn't go away. But as black goes d6, now this pawn on e5 is defended, and not a5 threat becomes real. That's why as soon as he plays d6, Gary usually puts the bishop back to b3 to safety. Now, as soon as your opponent goes bishop g4, we want to play h3. It makes sense for us to force your opponent to make a decision. So, does he want to take, does he want to go back, or does he want to maintain the pin? Because after that, it's easier for us to plan our next actions. We discussed that if bishop goes back to h5, you start this long journey of your knight to through f1 to g3, which slowly but surely builds up a winning attack for you on the king side. Now, another question that you may have here is, Let's take it back. What if instead of bishop h5, my opponent just takes here on f3? Is that all over? I can't use, you know, this bishop to develop my attack? No, it's actually good for you. Bishop f3 is a positional error of black, even though a lot of your opponents are not realizing this. Because bishop is a little bit stronger than a knight in reality. Like in classical chess books, they say that their power is equal, just not to overload beginners with too much uh, details. But fundamentally, a bishop is a bit stronger than a knight, so this exchange already favors you. Plus, you got your queen on f3, and as you remember in the previous variation, this queen is actually doing a good job here putting pressure. So we would love to have our queen here. In the future, we can also bring up the bishop to g5 and put more pressure against his knight. In some variations, maybe you can slide with your queen to g3. Let's say I'll play some move by black, to, just to show you the idea. And, you know, some bishop h6 things, you know, are also could be an issue. So, like, queen f3 is a pretty good position for your queen. It supports your attack. Let's take it back. And uh, finally, you can actually realize the very same plan. Crazy, right? You just use the very same plan no matter what black does. Because this exchange on f3 doesn't change anything in the sense that you can still play knight d2 after they do whatever they want, right? You can just maneuver with the same knight on f1, on g3, and develop the very same attack that we talked about. In fact, although your opponent may not realize it at this point, you're having quite a strong positional advantage here. You've got two bishops, which is already an edge by itself, plus he's got a lot of weak squares, weak pawns that you can target down the road, and it's hard for black to hold on here. By the way, if you want to improve your positional understanding overall, I've got a free masterclass where I explain all these complex terms and simple ways that you can understand and start implementing. You can click the link over here and check it out if you're interested. Also, I hope that you've enjoyed this lesson. If so, let me know in the comments below or if you have any questions, and I'll talk to you in the next videos. Ciao!